Hey guys, it's Crystal. I hope you guys are all having a good week and that everything is going well for you. For those of you who celebrated Canada Day, if you chose to, um, I hope that you had a good time. And for our American friends, happy 4th of July, guys. I really tried to be like 4th of July-ish today. I even have my like little headband on. So you guys already know that we're going to do part three of Ted Bundy today. If you're new to this channel, like I said, my name is Crystal. I do Canadian true crime or true crime with a Canadian twist. From time to time, I do international crimes as well. So if you're questioning why I'm doing Ted Bundy, that's why I'm doing an international crime. So hopefully we will be able to wrap it up next week, guys. God, there's a lot of information. I really dug deep to find out as much as we could about Ted Bundy. So hopefully, if that's something that interests you guys, you guys will like, hit that old like button. You guys will subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, and that you guys will leave me some comments. If you guys do choose to leave comments though, please no hate. These videos are for entertainment purposes or educational purposes only. They're, we're just here to talk. We don't need to throw accusations or terrible words around. And if you guys are returning subscribers, you guys already know how much I love you and how thankful I am that you guys tune in to watch me at least once a week. It's just mind blowing to me. So I'm very, very thankful for you guys. Before we get into Ted, because I know some guys, some of you are going to ask me about it. This week was a very important week for Canadian crime. This week, the man formerly known as Septic Tank Sam had actually been identified. He's also known as Tofield Doe or Sam Doe, if you guys want to know. His name is actually Gordon Edwin Sanderson, and he was 26 years old. He originally came from um, Manitoba, but he had been living in the Edmonton area for a while. If it sounds like something you guys want to hear, I will do an update on Septic Tank Sam, maybe after we've done Ted Bundy. Hopefully some more information will come out then. Uh, if that sounds like something you guys want me to do or redo of Septic Tank Sam, let me know in the comments down below as well. So a lot of information to get through today, guys. So many pages I wrote. I, I didn't even realize I'd wrote that many pages. Um, I'd written that many pages until I actually counted them. So hopefully we'll be able to make it through and my video won't get cut off this time. You guys know I'm long-winded. Uh, before we start though, I just wanted to show you uh, the victim list. I just want to show you some pictures of the victims. Hopefully you guys can see it. Um, those are a bunch of them right there. Of course, we're never going to know everybody that Ted Bundy killed. I think these are from Pinterest and um, I think a lot of them are Getty. Um, photographs too because I know they they want us to uh, acknowledge that so there you go and you guys already know that almost all of my information has been taken from the stranger beside me and the phantom prince because these are two people that knew Ted Bundy I would say as well as probably anybody could know Ted Bundy so when we last left off Ted had been going to law school in Salt Lake City of course in Utah he was going to the University of Utah in Salt Lake City and the murders in Washington had stopped at that point, the, the disappearances, because they didn't know at that point in time who was murdered and who wasn't. The disappearances had stopped. However, they had picked up again in Utah. And where we last left off, Ted had tried to, well, he did. He had abducted Carol Durant, but she was able to get away from him. She was able to escape. However, that night, he then drove 21 minutes away and kidnapped another young girl named Debbie Kent. Now, Debbie Kent has never been found, guys, just to let you know that. I didn't mention this victim before, so I'm going to mention her now. She does show up on some of the lists. Like I said, most of the victims I got from Anne Rule's book, but some of them she addresses later on, and we just weren't there yet. There was a woman. Well, she wasn't a woman. She was a girl. And on October 2nd of 1975, oh, sorry, 1974. We're still in 1974, guys. Sorry. From um, October 2nd of 1974, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox disappeared from her high school. Um, she was actually just going out to buy some gum and she never came back. She was about five foot six. She had long brown hair, parted in the middle, worn down. I keep mentioning this because this was his victim type, guys. He he liked that type of hair, which kind of creeps me out because I don't realize I'm doing it. <laughs> That's a little creepy. Sorry, guys. I don't, I'm not consciously wearing my hair that way. I don't actually ever wear my hair down except for to do these videos, just to let you guys know. Um, she was slender and she had hazel eyes as well. Um, 
she was from Holiday, Utah, which is about 20 minutes from Salt Lake City itself. So fairly accessible to Ted, but we already know he's been known to drive hundred, hundreds of kilometers, like hours away in order to abduct a victim. This way, it's probably to get the heat off of him because they come from different sections. Um, she was last seen, however, in a Volkswagen Beetle, which we know Ted loves to drive. And she was seen by people in this Volkswagen Beetle. Now, people actually assumed that Nancy was a runaway. They assumed so for years. And if you guys do look, she will still show up on Missing People Network, like uh, the Jane Doe Network, the John Doe Network, um, uh, Project Charlie, things of that nature. She will show up on there. Um, some people add her, actually, I should say most lists have her because it was found out later on that Ted or, um, confessed actually to kidnapping, raping, and murdering Nancy Wilcox. Um, like I said, she wasn't included in Anne's book at this point in time. Um, Ted claims he actually buried Nancy Wilcox's body with that of Debbie Kent. But like I said, Neither of them have ever been found, guys. So Liz, at this point in time, was actually able to go to the public library, like you can, and read um, articles from the Salt Lake Tribune. It would be on, like, microfiche. I don't know if people still use that. Remember, like, the little rolls that you get, you could see news articles from? But anyways, she was able to read about them. So it, it made things more concrete, I guess, in her mind. She's still wrestling at this point in time with is Ted guilty, is Ted innocent, because she would always try to dispel the similarities that she saw. She just simply couldn't believe it, right? And Rule did it too. Um, but it always came creeping back in her mind that this could be Ted, this could be Ted. So she was able to go to the local library. She did look up the articles, she saw them, and once again, uh, she went to go visit her bishop. Uh, she was fairly religious, guys, so she went to go visit her bishop, and he told her if she was that worried about it, that she should call police. Now, Liz said at this point in time, you know, I've called them so many times already. Uh, they're not really that helpful to me. He then offered to call them, but it didn't seem like anything that he found out anything. So Liz, once again, later on, called the Salt Lake City Police herself, and she was having troubles at this point in time, guys, sleeping at night. She could only actually sleep if she drank. She was really having a lot of problems with this, as I'm sure any of us would if any of us were really dating a serial killer. Like, could you imagine, right? Thinking things, but then not thinking things because when this person's around you, they're a different person. It was. It's very hard for people to get their mind around because Ted kept his life so compartmentalized, right? That's actually what they said about him. He would keep certain aspects of his life hidden from people. He only wanted certain people to know certain things. And in some cases, it was his way of setting up an alibi or of making himself seem more innocent, right? Um, the detective, actually, that she got a hold of, which was the same one that she'd spoken to before, had told her she was he was too busy to check into things on Utah. I mean... This is a really solid tip, so I don't know why he would have been like that. But anyway, she did say, hey, Ted Bundy lives down there, and now girls are disappearing from Utah. And she was, and showing up murdered, of course. And uh, he just told her they were too busy to look into things right now. Um, now, even though she was under this constant pressure, Christmas season of 1974, she always returned back to Utah. That's where her family lived. And it was Ted that actually picked her up from the airport. So when she was in his presence, she was always able to dispel her fears because she's like, there's no way this man could be the person that they're looking for. There's just no way, not the Ted I know. But when she wasn't with him, the fears started creeping up again. So in mid-December, a man actually called the Utah police hotline, right? They had a, a Ted line. Um, I don't think they knew him as Ted there. That was more a Washington thing, but they had a tip line, obviously, for all these uh, women that were showing up missing and murdered. So he called the tip line and said that on November 8th of 1974, when he was at, um, I'm trying to figure it out. Sorry, guys. The Viewmont. I always forget it. I don't know why. The Viewmont High School parking lot, which is where Debbie Kent disappeared from, that he saw a beat up Volkswagen Beetle that just basically tore rubber out of there at about 10.30 p.m. Um, if you'll remember, 
Debbie Kent had actually left at 10 o'clock, right, to go and get her brother from the rolling rink, but she had never shown up for it. So he had abducted her, obviously, from the parking lot. That's where they found the key for the cuffs that fit Carol Durant as well. And this was something that Carol Durant could back up. The Volkswagen Beetle that she had been in, that Officer Roseland had abducted her in, she also said had rust spots on it, had dents in it, and there was a tear in the fabric in the back seat. Um, Ted was known to, um, I guess, sand out the rust spots and get the dents out. He was also known for stealing cars, though. I do want you guys to remember that. Way back when, in the first video, if you guys will remember, um, when Ted was a juvenile, he was being looked at by police for burglary and grand theft auto. The charges never stuck, but he had been looked at for that. And I want you guys to keep that in mind because there are going to be points in times where different vehicles are described. We're just going to let that go. So Ted, of course, was not doing well in law school. Um, I don't know if it seemed like it to you guys, but it seems like to me any time that he put his focus on something, all areas or most of the areas of the rest of his other lives fell apart. So when he was focused on the killings, because he was out so much late at night and everything, he didn't have time to study. He couldn't focus on being a law student. And he said that most of the stuff that he was listening to in class was like basically incomprehensible to him. It didn't make sense. Um, when he focused on a relationship, remember, um, after he and Stephanie broke up, he then became more focused on ambition. If he had stayed focused on getting into law school and had not become a murderer, imagine what he could have done. But he didn't do that, obviously. So when he becomes focused in one area of his life, that's all he can be focused on. This is what it seems like to me. I don't know for certain. Obviously, I'm not a psychologist. I'm just saying it seems like that. So he was only getting a C average at this point in time, guys. And he had actually two incompletes with his classes as well. He was literally not doing well. So it would seem like when part of of one of his compartmentalized uh, life choices, life, lifestyles, because he had several, when part of that is falling apart, he then puts all of his brain power into something else. And at this point in time, he seemed to be more focused, obviously, on the crimes that would be attributed to him. Um, he was also calling Liz a lot at this point in time. They're together, guys, but he's obviously still seeing other women and things of that nature. So they are together. At points in time, it appears that they're pulling away from each other, but he would also get mad if Liz wasn't home when he called her. So I don't know if that was part of an impetus for him to go out and kill. Another thing I want you guys to know is that it was almost like he was setting up alibis for himself because... After murder dates, like um, like with Blake Samamish, when we talked about it, he then showed up at Liz's house for burgers and things like that. Or after he had kidnapped somebody, Melissa Smith, on the 18th, he called Liz right after. So it was almost like he was setting up an alibi. Oh, I talked to Ted that night. Sometimes he'd come for short visits too. Oh, I saw Ted that night. It's almost like he was unconsciously doing that, or he may have consciously been doing it as well. So police in Washington and Utah... We're starting to see the similarities between the cases that they had. They weren't quite ready to connect them, but they were starting to see the similarities. The fact that these were most of the women being kidnapped, being abducted and murdered, or if they were showing up murdered later on, seemed to be students. They were all white. They all had long hair that was parted in the middle that they wore down. Um, they were all slender. They were usually average height, some were a little above, some were a little below. They all appeared to live in university districts and they were all within a radius that Ted Bundy had frequented, let's just say. Um, when they found the bodies, they also noticed similarities, the bodies that they had been able to find that they were able to see tissue on because if you'll remember the Washington ones were more or less, in, in Oregon, right, Kathy Parks, were more or less we're going to get into that. We'll get into that. But they weren't as fresh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for having to say this as the bodies in Utah. But when they saw the bodies show up in Utah, they showed signs of being bludgeoned right there, especially around the head region. Um, um, 
They also showed signs of rape, uh, although in some cases it couldn't be definitive because it was, the body was too degraded. They showed signs of possibly being strangled, things of this nature, and they were always found nude, right? And there was no clothing or ID around them, nothing like that. So it would seem that they were connecting at this point in time that there was a possibility of a serial killer, but they still weren't together enough to say that at this point. Oh, and also they knew that this Ted, the Ted from Washington, drove a VW and that a VW was involved in some of the cases in Utah. They also um, acknowledged that, at least in Washington, this man sometimes appeared to have an injury. So because Liz had called the Utah police herself to report Ted, his name was, of course, added to the suspect list. However, he was checked out by the Utah police, I guess, and Utah cleared him just like Washington had twice. They said, quote, we checked him out. There is nothing to lead us to believe that he's anything more than just a law student, end quote. So they did actually check him out, but for some reason they weren't adding two and two together because he was so able to present himself, right? As, as oh, I'm just a law student. Oh, I'm just here to learn. You know what I mean? He was able to do that. So in January of 1975, Ted went back to Seattle uh, for a visit to see Liz and some of his other friends. Uh, it was like old times again for them. The two of them actually talked about marriage, things of that nature. It seemed to be a very good visit. And once again, while she was in his presence, Liz's fears about him were dispelled until, of course, he left again. Um, now, Karen Campbell was vacationing in Aspen, Colorado. So you guys know Aspen's a huge ski town, right? That's a place, it's usually a place where the wealthier people go to ski and they have chalets and everything like that. It's well known for its its um, ski slopes and things of that nature. And if you guys do remember, Ted Bundy did love to ski. So she was on vacation with her fiance and his two children. She was a registered nurse and she was from Michigan actually. And they were at the Wildwood Inn in Aspen, Colorado, on vacation. Um, she and her fiance had been fighting about the fact that she wanted to get married soon and he didn't seem to want to. He seemed to be okay with just their fiance type relationship. And he was also a doctor. So on January, uh, Karen was also 23 years old and she was slender, she was medium height. She had longish dark hair that of course she wore down and parted in the middle. Um, on January 12th, she and her fiance had dinner with some uh, other friends that were at the Wildwood Inn. She hadn't been feeling well that day. She thought she had a touch of the flu, so she didn't really eat that much. And it wasn't like the greatest dinner that she ever had. At some point in time, um, I think it was before 10 o'clock around, uh, no, it'd probably be around nine o'clock, somewhere in that, in that area. She went up to her room to go get a magazine. She told her fiance she was going up there to go get a magazine. So she should have been gone for about 10 minutes. She never showed back up. Detectives believe that she actually never made it to her room. Um, her fiance reported her missing, of course, a little bit after 10 p.m. Detectives checked around. They talked with everybody and nobody could remember seeing her go missing. Nobody remembered seeing her at that point in time. Once again, she disappeared into thin air in an actual building. So she was, her body was found February 18th of 1975. Um, this was actually close to the Wildwood Inn and she was basically found in a snowbank, guys. And the snowbank was like tinged with red. Of course, she was naked. The snow probably helped against decomposition. So she would not be as necroted, I guess, as some of the victims from Washington, especially those found in the summer. And some of the ones that were found in um, Utah as well. But the snow probably helped slow down decomposition so they could see things a little bit more clearly. So her head, once again, had been be beaten severely. And she also suffered, quote, deep cuts with a sharp weapon, end quote. If you guys do remember, Ted loves his knives. Now, they noticed that her hyoid bone, because she had also... Um, they figured she had been strangled. They noticed that her hyoid bone, you guys know what this is from watching many crime shows, I'm sure. It's a teeny tiny bone that's in your throat. And 
they're usually able to tell if people have been strangled or compressed, their neck compressed in some way, because the bone will either be cracked or broken. So the bone was cracked, but it wasn't, there wasn't enough tissue around it to, for them to definitively say she had also been strangled. Um, the pathologist was also not able to determine if she was raped. Um, the fluid, this, the melting snow would have actually washed off some of the fluid as well, but she was decomposed enough where the semen, if she had been raped, would have been too degraded um, for that point in time's technology to detect. Um, a tourist from California was able to remember that on the night of January 12th in the corridor, she saw a really, she saw a handsome man, a young handsome man with brown hair. Um, I believe she said that he actually smiled at her and, and she returned the smile or whatever. So she was able to give that tip. Once again, a handsome man is involved, but there's not really a whole lot to go off of. She was able to report that though. On Saturday, March 1st, 1975, two Green River, yeah, I know, creepy, right? The Green River, you know, Green River Killer, Tacoma. Sorry, Seattle and Tacoma, I'm telling you. Um, two, co uh, two college students from the Green River Community College were conducting like a forestry survey. And this would be in the Taylor Mountains in Washington State. Um, when, and this is about uh, 56 minutes away from Seattle, guys, just to let you know. Um, when they stumbled across a skull. Um, some people, some reports do say that there were bits of vertebrae found too. Um, I, I can't be certain of that, but they did find a skull. And of course, this was all that was left of Brenda Ball. They had finally been able to find her. So of course, police came out and were checking out the area. And Bob Keppel, if you guys will remember, we've talked about him before. The reason I mentioned him is because he really did get connected with Ted later on. We'll probably talk about that in the next video, their connection together. But Bob Keppel, you guys will know, also conducted some of the interviews in the Green River killings as well. So he's, he's fairly high up there when you talk about officers from Kings County. So he was out there searching and he managed, this would be on March 3rd, and he managed to fall down an incline and right into the skull of, um, I think it was Susan Rancourt. Yeah, right into the skull of Susan Rancourt. Mm -hmm. So her skull, as well as the skull of Brenda Ball, were horribly cracked, let's just say they were horribly fractured, particularly on the left side. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but Ted Bundy is left-handed. Remember, he wore his watch on his right hand. Um, and they were particularly, I don't want to say it, but they were particularly bashed in, particularly fractured on the left side. So it would seem that whoever had taken this, these girls had kind of created himself their his own personal grave site okay so that this person who they didn't know was Ted at the time they kind of thought but weren't sure um that Ted the mysterious Ted right because um uh, Naslin Dinot had been seen with Ted um they figured that he was creating his own personal grave site he obviously had killed the girls elsewhere and brought them here it was never, there were no other bones found with them though, other than the skulls and pulsable pieces of vertebrae from, from their spinal column. Um, no arm bones, no leg bones, nothing like that. They didn't find any purses, no ID, no clothing, nothing of that nature, just the skulls and possibly the vertebrae. Um, 50 feet from Susan's skull, they were able to find the skull of Kathy Parks. Remember from Oregon, she too had a lot of blood force trauma on her skull. And then the final skull that they found at Taylor Mountain was that of Linda Healy, the first victim to have disappeared um, in January of 1974. Um, like I said, nothing else was found with them. And these, uh, these skulls were found about 19.3 kilometers away from the Ott Nasland skeletal site. And, um, I believe Ted said that he had left George Ann Hawkins up there. Um, I still want to believe that it's possible she was with um, Denise and Janice because remember that that weird fifth bone 
that led pathologists to believe there was either three or four bodies there and later on Ted said that there were three bodies I think that might have been George Ann Hawkins's body maybe he had left his her skull on Taylor Mountain and um, animals had done away with it I don't know for sure so now is probably a good time to tell you what Ted actually did to the victims we've never gotten into that so warning trigger just in case guys this this is more graphic than what we normally get into so Ted would abduct these women he had various ways of doing it sometimes he faked the injury a lot of the times he would either stalk these women or peep on them for a while he did that with some of his victims with other victims they were just opportunity right they showed themselves at that particular point in time he was able to lure them into his car he would abduct them of course he would rape them and then he would kill them he would either use a knife in some occasions right like with Karen Campbell she had been stabbed with a sharp instrument he usually beat them severely about the head um which would fracture their skulls things of that nature um he was also known to strangle victims as well he, he really wanted to make sure they were dead I guess guys so according to Ted's own and then he would um transport them he he didn't necessarily kill them where they were found let's just say I'm I'm sure some he probably did but not I would say the most most of them he didn't because in a lot of cases the bodies were found many many kilometers away from where they had been kidnapped from there is some evidence some evidence that he may have kept some of them alive for days to torture um, and attack sexually attack for a more prolonged period of time there is some evidence that looks like he may have practiced bondage on them as well remember we spoke about that before with the tying up and things of that nature um there's some evidence of that but it's never been fully confirmed ted himself never fully confirmed that either now what we do know for sure is that ted said that he decapitated at least 12 of his victims um specifically the ones found on taylor mountain for sure and he would bring the skulls back to wherever place that he was staying at that point in time um violate the skulls repeatedly uh he brought them there so he could admire them those are his own words um, until they became so desiccated that he could no longer hold on to them. They would also smell, right? Uh, and then he'd transport them to Taylor Mountain. So it was really his own personal gravesite. These people were not people to him. If you remember, these victims were possessions to him. They were his, just like with the stealing. Oh, well, I wanted that. So I took it and it became mine. The same thing with these victims. You will hear serial killers talk about that, how their victims to them are no longer human Jeffrey Dahmer did it too they were his possessions they belonged to him now so he would then get rid of the skulls like I said on on the occasion where he didn't decapitate his victims he would often go back to the sites where his victims were only he knew where they were remember particularly in Washington state because he knew it better than most of the other states he was in um he would go back George Ann Hawkins he said he did this with and sometimes spend the whole night with them he would often revisit the scene and further defile the bodies and he was known to rape them vaginally and anally as well he would further attack them he would further sexually defile them until they too became so necroted that he could no longer go back to them and like I said sometimes he would spend the whole night with his dead victims uh he was also known uh particularly in the case of Melissa Smith to go back and wash their hair on occasion and he was also known to go back to some of the victims and put makeup on them to make them up in the way that he found the most attractive he literally did this guys he confessed to doing this so he really did and yes he was a necrophile before anybody asks yes he was um George Ann Hawkins Donna Manson Debbie Kent and next and Nancy Wilcox as well as some of the other victims their bodies have never been found guys so just to remind you at this point in time that's all that we've gotten up to their bodies have never been found um the crimes in Utah seem to have stopped after Debbie Kent. Now it could be that Ted was figuring people were starting to be on to him. 
so he let it be and moved on to Colorado at that point in time. Although I do want to remind you, he still lived in Salt Lake City. He didn't ever live in Colorado. He still lived in Salt Lake City. Um, on March 15th, 1975, 26-year-old Julie Cunningham, who is actually, as far as I know, the oldest victim, disappeared from Vail, Colorado. So this is another prominent ski town in Colorado, which is about an hour and 51 minutes away from Aspen. So Julie was pretty, she was slender, she had long dark hair, she wore parted in the middle, and she wore it down. She lived in Vail with a friend, and she worked part-time at a sporting goods store, but she also worked part-time as a ski instructor. The thing about Julie is that she was really naive. Um, she fully acknowledged that she was not good in relationships let's just say she always fell for the wrong type of man and this depressed her guys at 26 she was feeling a little bit older i don't know why but she was um and she wanted to be married she wanted to be settled down she had just been blown off by um a boyfriend that she thought she might be able to set settle down with she was just very unlucky in love and she was known to fall for guys who use terrible pickup lines so it doesn't seem that unlikely that she would go with Ted. Um, she was feeling depressed that day on March 15th. So she called her mother up and she felt a little bit better after talking to her mom. So she decided she was going to get ready and go out to a local tavern. Uh, it was fairly close to her house. A tavern's like a bar, guys. They didn't say bar in there, so I'm just going to call it a tavern. Um, and her roommate, her friend roommate, was already actually at the tavern, so she figured they could just uh, have some drinks and have a good time. She never actually arrived at the tavern. She just once again disappeared into thin air from off the streets, um, and she was reported missing uh, fairly soon after. On April 6th, of, we're still in 1975, Denise Lynn Oliverson, who was 25, vanished from Grand Junction, Colorado. So this is a town on the Colorado-Utah border. Of course, because they border each other, it was easier for, just like Oregon and Washington, right? It was easier for Ted to go from one state to another. Um, and it's about four hours and 24 minutes. Four hours, guys. Four and a half hours from Salt Lake City. Uh, she was married and on that date, on April 6th, she and her husband had had an argument about something. So she decided she was going to go and visit her parents. Her parents didn't live that far away. I'm, I'm assuming they also lived in Grand Junction, guys. So she was just going to hop on her bike and bike to her parents' house, um, ostensibly to cool off after this argument with her husband. She didn't call her parents to tell, her, to tell them she was coming. They're her parents. She often just stopped by and she set off on her bike. Now, since her parents didn't know she was coming, they didn't realize that she hadn't shown up, right? They had no idea she was coming, so they never reported her that night. They never talked to her husband. And her husband also figured that she was staying the night at her parents' house because she was so upset and that she didn't want to talk to him that night. So it wasn't until April 7th that he called up her parents and asked to speak to his wife, and they said, well, she's not here. And he said, oh, she's supposed to be you know she took off on her bike yesterday to go to your house and of course they became worried because they thought she was at home with her husband police were called now when detectives came they decided to scope out her most likely route the most likely route she took on bike um, to get to her parents house and when they did they discovered her bike and her shoes uh, i just want to get it right guys under a viaduct near a railroad bridge on the Colorado River. So they were able to discover these things, but nothing else. Denise has never been found either, guys. Her body's never been found. Um, this is one of the first instances, actually, where Ted left some evidence behind, which is really weird because usually when he was, of course, she was probably just a victim of circumstance. I don't think he was stalking her or anything like that, not in Colorado. Um, but it's one of the few instances where he left a clue behind, technically speaking. Uh, in, in Janice Ott's case, right, they never did find her bike. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we talked about another case with a bike as well. The bike was never found. They just, they, oh, um, I don't think we've gotten to that case yet. Never mind. 
<laughs> they they didn't find the or they didn't find anybody else's bike so and they never found anybody else's shoes so i'm just saying this is odd that ted left this behind he did acknowledge that at one point in time uh after he took uh george ann hawkins from that 40 feet of alleyway he came back later on and actually picked up her earring and one of her shoes as well so he's usually known for cleaning up a scene really well he didn't this time Maybe he figured it didn't matter. I'm not sure. On April 15th, this is just nine days later, guys. So he's escalating at this point in time. Uh, Melanie Cooley, who was 18 and looked remarkably like Debbie Kent, enough that they could be sisters, actually, guys, walked away from her high school in Nederland, Colorado. So this is about an hour and five minutes um, away from Denver, Colorado, which I believe is the state capital. I hope I'm not wrong, guys. I'm sorry. Um, and Melanie was actually found eight days later. She, once again, medium height, um, slender, long hair, worn down and parted in the middle. Um, she was actually found eight days later by road workers, um, in a mine shaft or sorry, not in a mine shaft. That's a different victim. Sorry. Sometimes they run together guys. So she was obviously horribly battered, especially around the head area. And police believed she had actually been hit on the back of the head by a rock. That's what it looked like to them. Um, sometimes Ted would use objects were just lying around. So I'm assuming he didn't actually go looking for Melanie Cooley. Once again, she was probably just a victim of circumstance. Uh, her hands had been tied together, though, in this case. And a dirty pillowcase was found around her, like twisted around her neck. So detectives believed this pillowcase was either used to used to strangle her or it was possible that it had been a blindfold around her eyes and that it had slipped down and become tangled uh, during a struggle or during her murder. Um... Once again, Ted seems to be escalating his kills at this point in time. Uh, he has shorter periods of time between his kills. There must be something about April, March and April that escalates him, March, April, May. So on May 6, 1975, uh, Lynette Don Culver, who was only 12 years old and is one of Ted Bundy's youngest acknowledged victims. Remember, some of them he wouldn't talk about due to their age. Um disappeared from Alameda Junior High in Pocatello, Idaho. So if you're keeping track, this is the fifth state, Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, this was at lunchtime. Uh, she was 5'2". She had long, dark hair that she wore parted in the middle and down. And she just up and disappeared. Now, some students did report seeing her uh, on a bus later on, like closer to home time. But what is known is that she never made it home, guys. She just legitimately disappeared. Uh, Ted actually later confessed that he kidnapped her, brought her to a Holiday Inn where he assaulted her and then drowned her in the bathtub of the Holiday Inn before dis discarding of her body in the Snake River in Idaho. Um, she, of course, has never been found. Uh, sometimes she's on the list. Sometimes she isn't, guys. For the most part, she is on the list because he did confess to it later. Now, in some of the cases where Ted later confessed, certain detectives didn't believe him. Okay, that's why some of these women's names, particularly the ones that have never been found, uh, like Lynette, uh, like Susan Curtis, who we'll talk about soon, um, whereas some of these victims, Nancy Wilcox, uh, because their bodies, Debbie, well, they knew he took Debbie Kent, but Nancy Wilcox, um, because their bodies have never been found, they'll sh they're still once again show up in the Charlie Project or on John Doe lists. Um, I shouldn't say Don, John Doe lists, missing persons list. They'll sh their names will still show up there. They believed, they were uncertain if Ted had killed them because they didn't have bodies. But Ted is not a serial confessor. It took him a long, long time to confess to anything in the first person, especially. So to be honest with you, I don't believe that Ted would ever confess to crimes he hadn't done. He just doesn't seem like that type of person. He's not a Henry Lee Lucas at all. I feel like if Ted was confessing to something, then he probably did it. In early June of 1975, Ted actually surprised Liz and he came down for a visit. He stayed about five days. Um, this would be at her place in Washington. 
Uh, Liz noted that Ted's license plate was not attached the proper way to his car. It was actually propped up in the window. So when she asked him about it, he said, oh, it just fell off and he hadn't um, been able to get it back on the proper way. There is some evidence, guys, that Ted switched plates so that he couldn't be as easily identified. If you remember, Paul Bernardo did this too on his border runs so that the car when it went across the border would show up as belonging to somebody else and not lead directly back to him. This could be the reason why Ted was doing that. He had two sets of plates. Um, one was registered and one wasn't, I'm assuming, or one was outdated, something of that nature. And he did switch back and forth between them. So it could have been something along those lines to further throw people off from him. So Liz and Ted, of course, fought once again about the possibility of him dating other women. He was. He tried to tell her that this one specific woman was just a friend and that he loved Liz. You know how Ted, Ted is. He's very manipulative. So on June 27th or June 28th, some sources said it was the 27th. Some said it was the 28th. So I'm just going to say on or about that day. 15-year-old Susan Curtis disappeared from Provo, Utah. She was five foot seven. She had hazel eyes and she had long dark hair that she wore down and parted in the middle. Um, she also had braces. She was actually from Bountiful, Utah, which we've already talked about Bountiful in the last video. And she was in Provo to attend um, the Bountiful Orchard Youth Conference at the Brigham Young, Young University in Provo. That's why she was there. She actually biked there. Um, it's 87 kilometers, guys, from uh, Bountiful to Provo. She actually biked there. So she also had her bike with her. And she actually biked there. I can't believe it. This is a long time. She actually biked there. Um, and Provo is about 48 minutes from Salt Lake City, just in case you guys want to know. So on the first night of this two-day conference, it was a two-day conference, there was a formal banquet. And because she wore braces... Uh, she and her friends had exited the building and she told her friend group she was going back to the dorm to uh, brush her teeth, right? You know, if you have braces, you have to get the food, you have to brush your teeth after you eat. So she said she was going back to the dorm room to do this. She never showed up at the dorm room, guys. Her toothbrush actually was dry. That's how they knew. Um, police believe, like I said, she'd never made it. Now, a professor at the university claimed to have seen Susan four days later selling some textbooks at the university. This is strange to me, and it doesn't seem likely to me that he saw her because she was 15 years old and not a student at the university. So I don't know why she would have textbooks or even be trying to sell them. Um, and ostensibly, four days later, she should have been back in Bountiful. However, uh, he, was, he actually ID'd her picture from a photograph of her. However... She was known, Susan was known to run away. So that's why police um, kind of trusted that this professor may have seen her. She was known to run away. I don't know where her bike went either. See, there's another thing. Her bike has also disappeared. Police um, thought that she was a, a runaway at that point in time, but uh, she always came home shortly afterward, like within a couple days, within a few days, you know, three, four, maybe five days. She always showed up back home. So this was a little different this time. Um, Ted said that he kidnapped her, um, raped her and murdered her. And that he left her body along a highway in Price, Utah. He then later said he actually buried her body someplace in Price, Utah. It has, once again, never been found. On July 1st, this is another victim that is sometimes on lists, sometimes not. Anne Rule talked about her, so I'm going to include her on the list. Shelly K. Robertson did not sh uh, show up for work. She was 24 and she lived in Golden, Colorado. She just didn't uh, show up for work. She never showed up for work. Um, her family actually checked around and found out that she had been seen with friends on June 30th, so the day before. And a police officer said that he saw her July 1st. Um, Quote, in the company of a wild-haired man driving an old pickup, end quote. Like I said, you guys are supposed to remember that Ted does steal vehicles. 
uh, she wasn't ever seen alive again. So like Brenda, Donna, Laura, and to some extent, Susan, Shelly was free spirited. She would often hitchhike guys and go off on an adventure for a while. Uh, if you'll remember, it took them 19 days to report uh, Donna Manson uh, as missing because she was known to go on these whim trips. But as the summer went on, as July faded into August, her family was like, she's just been gone for too long. She's been gone too, for way too long. So they reported her missing. On August 15th, her naked body was found 500 feet in a mine shaft. In a mine shaft of all places, guys. Um, you know that Utah and Colorado are riddled with mine shafts. There's a lot of other places too, um, from people who used to look for gold, silver, other elements, things of that nature. So there's a lot of mine shafts in the area. So she was, five, she was found 500 feet into this mine shaft. And this was at a place called Berthode Pass, Colorado, which is actually an hour and 25 minutes away from Golden. So like I said, he would transport the bodies long distances. Um, her cause of death, of course, could not be determined because at that point in time, she was once again just far too decomposed to be able to tell. Um, the mine shaft itself is actually close to Vail, Colorado, though, just to let you know. And Ted Bundy did confess to killing Shelley. No more women disappeared from Colorado at this point in time. So much like in the Utah and Washington cases, they the disappearances and murders started almost as, or stopped almost as soon, almost as soon as they started, almost like they started, right? It, you had this rash that was boom, 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 boom. And then all of a sudden it stopped. So in late July, Liz went to visit Ted um, in Utah. Uh, it was an all right visit. Of course, they argued about things, particularly about Ted's habit of stealing, right? He had all this new stuff and she knew he couldn't afford it. So he'd stolen it. Um, however, on this visit, they actually did become engaged. Uh, they decided to get married at Christmas time in 1975. They did decide to become engaged. Um, there was another strange incident at this point in time between Ted and Liz though. And of course she never put these things together until after, but they were visiting Flaming Gorge. It was Ted, um, Liz and actually her parents were visiting Flaming Gorge. Now they must have taken two vehicles to go there. They said it was an all right day. Uh, on their way back, she and Ted were just looking at scenic areas around Wyoming. And they saw a cow pasture that had a river in it. So they wanted to stop and get a, a look at it. Now there was a wooded area nearby this as well. And Liz said, quote, walking into the trees behind Ted, I was suddenly very scared and had an ominous feeling, end quote. So then she told Ted she wanted to go back to the car. It just didn't feel right. It was too much. He then turned and looked at her and said, quote, no, come with me. She said his voice, quote, sounded flat and hollow. And of course, we've heard this before, particularly Carol DeRanche talking about that. But in other incidences um, with Liz, remember the raft incident, he just sounded very flat and hollow and his face was almost blank, like he wasn't even seeing her. Um, however, she didn't go back into the woods with him and they went into the, they, they got into the car anyway. So most of Liz's family and her friends, of course, did not support her engagement to Ted. Number one, they knew too much. Uh, number two, it just didn't seem right. It, it just doesn't seem right. They know he's a suspect. It just doesn't seem right. They know about all of her suspicions, so they didn't support it. Now in August, she went and visited Ted at his family's cabin. So remember, Louise and Johnny had a cabin in Washington State. She went to visit him. And at that point in time, she found more stolen goods and she basically said, look, it's the choice between me and the theft. And she had said this actually in July and she had thought he was going to choose her, but he was clearly still stealing. So Liz said, quote, I won't marry you unless you straighten yourself out, end quote. And Ted didn't protest. He didn't try to say anything. He just said, quote, I'll always love you. Or he just said, quote, I want you to know that I'll always love you, end quote. So she said he actually sounded really relieved that they weren't engaged anymore. And she said it made her feel free. So there you go. On August 16th, 1975, at 2.30 in the morning, 
an officer with the Utah Highway Patrol, this is in Granger, Utah, was just arriving home. He was just finishing his shift and he was getting home when he noticed um, a car that just seemed out of place. It was a VW bug, of course, and it just seemed out of place. This is a residential area. They don't usually have traffic at 2.30 in the morning. He knew everybody's cars that lived in the area. It just didn't seem right. So he got curious and decided that he was going to see what this was about. So he turned on his lights and the car started driving at a high speed to get away from him. So he chased the car because the car obviously blew through two stop signs as well. Eventually, the car did stop at an abandoned gas station and he asked for, um, he went up and of course asked for ID and it was Ted Bundy. Now, Ted said that he was lost. He claimed he had gone to the drive-in theater. Drive-ins used to be huge. I loved drive-in theaters. I know there's still a couple in the area. I love drive-ins. So he said he'd been going to see actually the Towering Inferno at the Granger Drive-In and that he'd gotten lost on his way back. The officer knew that that movie wasn't playing, however, so it didn't seem right to him. Ted would later go on and say that he'd actually been smoking marijuana at this point in time and the reason why he had this high-speed chase was to get rid of the paraphernalia and that's why he claimed that he was lost. He didn't want the officer to arrest him for that. So the officer was able to note when he looked into the back of Ted's car, um, actually when he looked into the front and the back of Ted's car, that the passenger seat had been removed and was lying on its side in the back seat. So this gave him, this made him pause even further. Ted gave the officer permission to search the car. Now Ted would later deny doing this, but the officer said he did regardless that's what happened. And the officer saw a crowbar. I'm going to guess it was propped up behind the um, the driver's side back seat. It's not entirely clear from the way I read it, but that's where I would assume it was. And he also noted a satchel. He called it a satchel on the, I'm going to guess it was the passenger floor up front. And when he kind of looked in the satchel, he found the mother load. There was a ski mask in there, another crowbar, an ice pick, handcuffs, strips of um torn sheet uh there was um a, I did I think I mentioned the ski mask already rope was in there wire was in there um and a strange homemade type of mask this is a mask from the nightmares guys from anybody's nightmares so it was a nylon mask obviously it's a pair of women's pantyhose and you know the waist part goes over the head and he'd cut like eye holes into it and then he would tied the leg part into a knot up on top Ugh, it's the stuff of nightmares I'm sorry it just freaks me out so much um and so because of this, Ted was charged not only with evading an officer, but also later, a little bit later on, with possession of burglary tools. He's finally arrested. Ted Bundy has finally been arrested. Um, they didn't realize at that point in time, though, that what they were actually looking at was Ted's kill kit, his murder, his rape and murder kit. So Ted was brought into the police station, but he was later um, released on his, quote, own recognizance. These aren't the worst charges to have, so he was released that way. So Ted's arrest in Granger actually piqued the interest of Jerry Thompson, if you remember we've talked about him before, from Salt Lake City, Utah Police. Um, he was sure that he'd heard Ted Bundy's name before and it took him a little while to figure it out. And he's like, oh yeah, right. I talked to his girlfriend in relation to the Utah slayings. He put the call together with the items that were found in Ted Bundy's car and he figured Ted was connected to the Carol DeRange case. Because of that, he was more than likely connected to Debbie Kent then, of course, Melissa Smith and Laura Amy, so on and so forth. He figured that they were all connected. On August 21st, Ted was officially charged with possession of burglary tools. And he actually thought it was funny. He thought it was a big joke. He figured that the charges would never stick. He was like, whatever. I don't even know what you guys are doing. Like, it's so preposterous to me that you would think that I'm a burglar. Uh, he kept making up. 
he kept making up stories about pieces of evidence about what these these pieces of evidence were for oh you know the crowbar i used to help people out with and the handcuffs he claims he found in a dumpster and he said that the creepy nylon mask he had was quote he used it as protection under his ski mask against the icy winds of ski slope of ski slopes end quote so both sergeant hayward um who was another officer from uh, salt, lake, salt lake city and who had talked to liz actually earlier and cleared ted bundy earlier and detective thompson figured that ted was good for the carol deranch case for sure and that they were highly suspicious that he was also connected to the murder and disappearance cases as well in Utah, in Utah. So Ted agreed to let them search his apartment. Um, because there was no search warrant involved, though, they couldn't collect any evidence that they found. But they could have a, good, a really good look around and come back later with a search warrant. So while they were there, they actually found a map of Colorado. And the Wildwood um, Inn was circled on it. They also found a brochure from the Bountiful Recreation Center. Ted said that he'd never been to Colorado, so one of his friends must have left the map there. And he also claimed that somebody must have dropped the brochure in, at his house as well. Now, Jerry Thompson claims that he, when he opened the closets, he saw patent leather shoes there. And if you'll remember, Carol DeRanch described them. So did the drama teacher from the Debbie Kent kidnapping. They both described Officer Rosalind as wearing these patent leather shoes. Um, however, when they did later come back with a search warrant, the shoes were gone, as well as some of the stolen goods that Ted had too. So Ted's mugshot was then shown to Carol DeRanch and the drama teacher from uh, Viewmont. I think I got it right this time, Viewmont High School. And the teacher positively ID'd Ted Bundy. She said he was a, quote, dead ringer, end quote, for the man that she had saw that night. Um, Carol DeRanch, uh, she also figured that the man had just... Um, shaved his mustache. That's what she figured out from the picture. Now, Carol DeRanch wasn't as positive as the drama teacher. She did pick out Ted's photo from a photo lineup. This was all from photo lineups, guys. She did pick out his picture and she said, quote, it looks something like him, but I really can't be sure, end quote. Now, remember, I've told you guys before, Ted Bundy is like a chameleon. One slight change in his hair um, or, you know, growth or shaving uh, of his facial hair can make him look completely different. So they showed Carol Ted Bundy's license photo in another photo lineup the next day. And it was then that she positively ID'd that Ted Bundy had been the man, Officer Rosalind. So police quickly put Ted under 24-hour um, surveillance, of course. Uh, he appeared nonchalant and disbelieving about his own arrest. He like made jokes about it and stuff. He's like, there's no way. There's just no way. They'll never, they don't have the proof to hold me. It's just, it's ridiculous nonsense is basically what he thought about it as. And he was amused that the police thought he was involved in the Washington or in the Utah cases for sure. But he was probably really sweating it out at this point in time, guys, because he's real close to being found out, right? So police were also, of course, connecting him to the Washington and Utah cases. Um, but he heavily denied this. He heavily denied that he had anything to do with those cases. So then they requested to see his credit card records and his law school records at that point in time. I'm just going to see if I can pull up his mugshot picture from that time, guys. Just give me one second. So, oh God, it's so creepy. This is it, guys. Like, it's, it's fairly creepy. He, he does look a, a bit scary there. That's his mugshot from that point in time. But a lot of the people would have, his hair probably would have been shorter in 74. It was almost a year before, right? So his hair probably would have been shorter, you know, and he was wearing the mustache, right? Because he wanted to present himself as a clean cut officer. Um, Ted called Anne in September of that year. 
and told her, quote, Anne, you're one of the few people I can trust in Seattle, end quote. So, of course, this made her feel even more guilty because she had already phoned him in to the tip line in Washington in August of 1974. So it made her feel really guilty. Um, he asked her why, why the police had subpoenaed his law records and to see if she could find out why. She told him she could, or she would see what she could do, but she had to do it all legally, right? Anne used to be a police officer, number one, but number two, they were her contacts for her true crime writing. So she didn't want to in any way ruin that relationship. Plus she used to be a law officer. She doesn't want to do things the illegal way. And she told them that she would have to say, hey, this is for Ted Bundy. He said he was fine with that. And that was great. So when she called, she actually chose, to, uh, she actually spoke to Kathy McChesney. We're going to talk about her some more too. And Kathy was kind of elusive about it. She said, oh yeah, he's one of 1200 people that we're looking at at this point in time. And knew there was something more to it. Uh, but she didn't push, of course. And she told Ted exactly what had been said. At this point in time, though, Anne did not know about the Utah cases. She had no idea about them. She only knew about the Washington ones. I'm sure she had read something about them, but she, she just hadn't put two and two together about that. So Anne was actually told, um, oh, sorry, guys, uh, by Ted, that he'd been arrested because police had found him in possession of burglary tools. And he said that, of course, the charges would never stand up in court. Anne couldn't believe it. She actually said, quote, Ted Bundy with burglary tools? Impossible, end quote. So she actually had no idea that he loved to steal, right? That was not a facet of his life that he ever showed her. And he also told her the officers had, quote, some wild idea that I'm connected with some cases in Washington, end quote. He also told her he'd be in a police lineup the next day. This didn't make sense to Anne, because remember at this point in time, she didn't know about the Utah cases. She wondered why he was gonna be in a, in a lineup in Utah for cases in Washington. It just didn't make a lot of sense to her. And of course, Ted had never mentioned the Utah cases to her because she didn't know. Um. So you have to imagine Anne's surprise when October 2nd of 1975, her old friend Ted was back in the newspaper under the headline, Theodore Robert Bundy arrested for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault in Salt Lake City. So he was arrested October 2nd of 1975 for that. Um, Rearrested, I should say. Remember, he was out technically on his own recognizance from the possession of burglary tools and the evading police. Uh, this time he's rearrested and his bail is $100,000. So he's in jail. And this did not sit well with Ted. He had to give up his freedom at this point in time, right guys? So you know it doesn't sit well with him. So Anne couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe that her gentle, sympathetic, kind friend could have anything to do with a kidnapping case. It just didn't make sense to her. She may have had her suspicions before, but when it's like thrown right in her face like that, she just, she couldn't believe that this man who'd helped so many people from the crisis clinic had done this to somebody. Um, the two of them actually stayed in fairly regular contact from that, from now on. Um, she was a person he trusted and he almost saw her as a mother figure. He didn't want her necessarily to know about the weird faucets of his life, about his other life. He wanted her to stay his friend, but also he figured he could manipulate her for what she knew from the police. It's Ted. And Anne, for her own part, almost saw Ted like a younger brother. She had had a brother who actually killed himself when her brother was 21. And she saw Ted as being similar to her brother. And... It just, even though she had her her suspicions, it just didn't make sense to her. She just couldn't fathom that her friend that appeared one way to her could actually be this monster. It just didn't. So they would actually call each other, or she, uh, he would actually call her and they would write to each other. She also sent him uh, like stamps and, and little bits of money as well. And this would be, this this contact would go on for years, guys. 
Um, he sent her a message saying, uh, through the news actually, saying that he was okay and that things would work out. So several other Utah witnesses had also picked Ted Bundy out from a lineup. Um, this lineup is actually a questionable lineup. It's a regular police lineup. It's not photos, guys. Because the other people that they had in the lineup with Ted were all older and like, you know, like paunchier than Ted was. And remember, everybody described seeing a young man um, who was, uh, you know, fairly athletic build. So it was almost like the lineup was skewed to have people point out Ted. So it was questioned later on. Um, from this point on, like I said, Ted stayed in contact with Anne. He also stayed in contact with Liz. Uh, even though she figured, even though, you know, Anne was coming to conclusions that he may be guilty or that he may have had something to do with these things, she still felt he needed support and she still saw him like that little brother figure. Um, Ted did not fare well in jail, of course. He hated it. He hated every little thing about it. He kept lamenting about his lost freedom. It wasn't necessarily so much as what he was charged with. He did talk about that a lot, or in, in some degree as well. But it was more, oh my god, I lost my freedoms. I can't believe this. Uh, he'd write poetry to Liz and Anne from jail, things of that nature. Uh, he also wrote that he had found God and was now part of the Mormon religion. He had been raised a Methodist, I believe. Uh, he was now saying that he was part of the Mormon church. I don't actually believe most prisoners when they claim that they found religion that fast, like, oh, I don't know, Chris Watts. I doubt he's found religion. There's not a lot of books to read, so most of them do take up reading the Bible. And, you know, when your parole hearing comes up, it sounds good that you say, oh, I found God. He showed me my ways, my error, the errors of my ways. So I don't, I don't believe that he found God, but regardless, he said he did. Um, so no one at this point in time that was, that was connected to Ted seriously, that was a good friend of his or uh, someone like Liz that he dated or or his mother or stepfather, brothers, sisters, no one believed that Ted could possibly have done this. So he had also been causing calling Liz as well. So even though they'd broken off their engagement and had essentially broken up, um, they still talked. So Liz actually saw Ted's former landlord in September of that year. And the former landlord told Liz that the King County PD had been asking about Ted. Um, the officer that had been asking about him was, of course, Kathy McChesney. So this is how Liz got involved with the police once again. She called them and, and it was Kathy McChesney that told Liz that Ted had been found in possession of burglary tools. Remember, this is before he was arrested for the aggravated assault. Um... She once again had to go into great detail about her life with Ted, especially their sex life. If you can imagine how uncomfortable that must have been. Um, the fact that he was nocturnal, the fact that he uh, would sometimes come and visit her and leave throughout the night and then come back maybe the next morning or she might not see him that often. The fact that on the dates for some of the disappearances that she knew of anyway, um, Ted had either called her that night or had come to see her. Uh, it just, things of that nature. Um, she told them all about it. Uh, she also, uh, Kathy actually wanted to know about those dates and times to see if, if Liz could ever alibi Ted. Um, they spoke often, of course, in the next few weeks about Liz's relationship with Ted. Um, Kathy was also the one that broke the news to Liz that Ted had been engaged to Stephanie Brooks in 1973. Liz had never known about that until Kathy McChesney told her. Uh, she said, actually, well, uh, quote, well, that proves he is a dishonest lover, but that does still doesn't make him a murderer, end quote. So Liz was also meeting at this point in time with Utah police and Bob Keppel. Bob Keppel, interestingly enough, was Kathy McChesney's partner. So she was meeting up with police who had questions about the missing and murdered women. Uh, she was told by Detective Thompson from Utah that Ted was a, quote, song, uh, strong suspect, end quote, in the Carol DeRange case. Um, something Liz had already had suspicions about earlier, because remember, she had actually phoned a tip in uh, in 1974 to uh, the Utah police 
It was actually to Jerry and uh, he, he didn't pay much attention to that and Detective Hayward as well. Um, sorry, uh, Sergeant Hayward as well. Um, once again, she had to go over all the details of her life with the Utah police and with Bob Keppel. So she had to keep reiterating about this stuff. Um, they kept asking her about patent leather shoes. Um, like, uh, have you ever seen Ted wearing these patent leather shoes? Do you know where he keeps his patent leather shoes? And she couldn't understand because she'd actually never seen him wear patent leather shoes. They also kept asking her um, the next day, she was interviewed again the next day, about a droopy mustache, about Ted having a droopy mustache. And she's like, no, 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 I've never seen Ted with a real mustache. He has like a fake mustache that he puts on sometimes asking her if it looked okay, like if he'd look good with a mustache. But she'd never seen him with this quote droopy mustache. So remember, compartmentalizing certain parts of his life, only certain people can ser see certain sides of him. Um, she also re-mentioned the plaster, um, plaster of Paris that she found in his apartment before. She mentioned the crutches again, um, the three times that they'd had bondage and she did actually break and reveal that he had choked her during the last time. And that's why they never practiced it again. Um, she did mention again that he was nocturnal, that on certain dates he would have called her, things of that nature. Um... Also, if you guys, if you think about it, guys, there's, there's, it makes sense that Ted wasn't doing well in law school. He was too busy living his other life at night. So when would he have had time to sleep or study? Like it just, it makes sense that he wasn't doing well in school because he was so busy and fixated on, on living out his other self at that point in time. Um, she also told the officer about Ted's lying, about the fact that he stole, and that he'd gotten angry when she talked about cutting her hair. Anytime she talked about cutting her hair, he'd get angry. Not like super, I'm going to hit you angry or anything, but he'd be like, no, 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 you can't do that. Don't do that. Um, she also said that there had been a few times when she had woken up at night and Ted had been under the blankets with a flashlight just looking at her body. She did mention that. It's really creepy. So both Anne and Liz were still deeply confused. Ted did know at this point in time that Anne had a book deal about him. And, uh, or about the cases, the Washington cases. And he actually said it was okay that she used information from him because he figured it would prove him innocent. You know what I mean? And that a real life or like a, a true version of what happened should come out through his mouth. A true version of who he was should come out from his mouth. So he was okay with Anne writing a book. Um, she still thought of Ted as a friend. Oh my gosh, my kids are really going at it today. She still thought of Ted as this really good friend of hers. And Liz still thought of him as the love of her life. So she thought this, but Anne also knew that it was highly likely that he was manipulating her into giving him into giving him information from the police. She didn't, of course, do that, but she was aware that he was likely manipulating her. So in various in the various states involved, uh, mostly Utah, Washington, and Colorado, uh, not Idaho at this point or Oregon, they didn't really even have any inkling. There was only one victim from each, so they didn't really have any inkling that he was involved. Um, were connecting the dots, especially Colorado. Um, they were discovering evidence uh, from the credit card receipts, from the law school transcripts, things of that nature, that put Ted in those states um, at around those places when the abductions and, and subsequent murders had occurred. Um, Anne was interviewed because of the fact that she and Ted were friends. And uh, the picture of Ted that was emerging from this was of a man that had two lives. He was this gentle, affable, um, handsome, loving, kind friend who went out of his way to help people, um, to certain people in his life who had worked at the crisis center, who had talked people off of a ledge, seemed like a great guy. But they were also getting an emerging picture of him being a charming manipulator. The fact that he lied, the fact that he stole, the fact that he used women, he was a, a womanizer, the fact that he 
sometimes showed versions of certain behaviors to some people and not to others, or, or he would show certain people just sides that he wanted them to see. These were pictures that were starting to emerge from all the various accounts of Ted. Um, so even though he was still talking and writing to Liz and like courting her, if you will, at this point in time, they're dating, but not dating. It's very hard to keep track. Um, he was also manipulating other women at this point in time down in Utah to do his bidding as well, because he couldn't be left alone. Though Ted loved women, he hated women, but he also couldn't be left alone by women, just to let you know. And he needed these people to believe he was innocent, number one, but also to feed him information. Um, according to Anne, quote, he would always have at least one woman entranced by him, end quote. So on November 25th, 1975, so this is actually the day after his 29th birthday, Ted was released on bail. Uh, Louise and Johnny had raised enough money. Yeah, Johnny, the stepdad that he disliked so much and thought was below him, had raised enough money uh, to set him free on bail. Um, Louise, his mother, deeply, deeply believed that Ted was innocent, and she believed that for a long, long time, guys. She could not believe that her son was involved in any of this, not from the side of her son that she saw. Even though he knew, she knew that uh, you couldn't loan him money and that he stole stuff. She just couldn't believe this from her son. So Ted and Liz, oddly enough, at this point in time, got back together. They got back together. He manip If that doesn't show you how manipulative he is, I don't know what will. They actually got back together at this point in time. Um, and he met up with Anne a couple times while he was free on bail, too. Uh, he was free, but not free. Um, he liked the surveillance he actually knew the surveillance was going on he wasn't a stupid man obviously he knew they were surveilling him and he liked to lead them on car chases he liked to see if he was going to lose the cops during car chases and he was like super happy if he ever did manage to lose them um the police warned liz actually not to be driving around in a car with ted because of these dangerous high-speed chases, because of the fact that he liked to whip around. I shouldn't say high-speed or else they would have arrested him, but because of how dangerous these chases could be. They'd seen her in the car several times, and they warned her not to be in a car with Ted at this point in time due to the surveillance. On January of 1976, he once again met up with Anne. In January, I should say, of 1976. And he, of course, told her he was innocent. He scoffed at all the evidence. He scoffed at the charges. He thought they were a joke. It was amusing to him. He laughed about the surveillance and how fast he could get away from them, things of that nature. Uh, he did reveal at this point in time to Anne that Liz had told him that she had called him into the police and that she had told uh, the police all about the relationship. He said he was actually okay with it. He told Liz that she was only doing what she had to do and that um, as long as she told the truth, everything would be fine. His version of the truth. You guys have to understand he manipulated the narrative of their whole relationship. So he may be telling her one thing that she believed to be truth, but it wasn't actually truth. Uh, at the end of their meeting, Anne actually said, quote, I cannot be completely convinced of your innocence, end quote. And Ted, re and Ted responded to her, quote, that's okay. I'd like to tell you everything, but I can't, end quote. So Ted's trial for the aggravated kidnapping charges in the Durange case, of course, started February 23rd of 1977. Um, Ted elected to do this by judge only. He didn't want a jury. He just wanted the judge. And he was found guilty, of course, on March 1st. Now, there was some trouble with the sentencing. He wasn't sentenced for quite a while afterwards. Um, he, he felt that he was found guilty because he chose to, to acknowledge that he had lied on the witness stand. He had lied about... Um, he had lied to the officer about going to the drive-in because he claimed that he was smoking weed and he didn't want the officer to know he was. So that's what he claimed to have lied about. And he figured that's why they found him guilty. None of the other evidence. Because, of course, the cases at this point in time, you have to remember the cases, not the Durange case so much, but a lot of the other cases surrounding Ted are circumstantial. There's no direct evidence. So, of course, at this point in time, Ted had to go un undergo uh, psychological testing. Some doctors found him to be passive aggressive, where he would act like he was this genial natured man. But when something threw him off, he would get angry. 
so they said that he was passive aggressive. There were, no one could actually agree and no one to this day can still agree on what Ted Bundy is. So some of them, of course, found him to be a sociopath or antisocial. It wasn't it wasn't so much a psychopath. That's kind of newer terminology. Um, but they found him in that realm. Some of them tried to say he had disassociative identity disorder, which Ted Bundy vehemently denied. So you guys know that's multiple personality disorders. Um, they thought maybe Ted, um, what he had done was so traumatic to him. He had either blocked it out. It wasn't traumatic to him. He remembered what he did or that it was another personality of his that did that. But he vehemently denied it. He's like, no, I know what I did. I was in fully control of myself without saying that he ever actually did anything. He's like, I know I did my, or I know what I've done from my day to day life. He didn't admit, of course, the killings then. Some of them, some of the psychiatrists actually said that he was normal or he claimed that they said that he was normal and had no sexual deviancy or anything of that nature. Um, Ted, of course, did deeply, deeply resent the intrusion into his mind. He didn't like that they were probing around, but he also knew what answers to give. You have to do, you do have to remember that about Ted. It's not like, it's not like he was unaware of what the tests were asking him. That's probably why he showed up normal in some because he knew how to manipulate the answers. Um, he also began to participate in his own legal, um, with his own legal team at this point in time. Remember, Ted was a law student. He does know the law and he doesn't actually trust his lawyers for the most part. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. So he started to participate in his own defenses at this point in time, particularly with the sentencing. He wanted to have his own words out there. But eventually... Eventually, on June the 30th of 1977, he was sentenced to one to 15 years in the Durange case. One to 15 years. It's not that much, but he was sentenced. On October 19th of 1976, the warden at the prison where Ted was staying, which was um, the Utah prison, actually found a, quote, escape kit mm -hmm, in Ted's cell. So this was actually this kit, this kit contained a social social security card, a sketch of a driver's license. I don't know, a sketch. And road maps as well as airport schedules. So of course, Ted was thrown into the hole for 15 days. He, he had an escape kit. On October 22nd of 1976, Ted was officially charged with his first charge of murder. And that was of Karen Campbell from in, in, Colo in Aspirin, God, I can't speak right now, in Aspen, Colorado. Um, the pieces had had finally come together for, for that state at least, um, and for Utah. Washington had also put cases together, but because the evidence was so circumstantial at that point in time, um, the cases kind of stalled. It was only, Colorado worked really fast too. Like I'm, I'll give it to their detectives. Colorado worked fast in this case and they were able to charge him with uh, Karen Campbell's murder. So meanwhile, Liz was actually getting her life back together at this point in time. She'd stopped drinking. She had started going to AA. Ted actually supported her in this. Um, he was constantly bombarding her with love letters at this point in time. Remember, he was keeping in regular contact with both her and Anne. And he told her that most of the psychologists had said that he was normal and not sexually deviant. Like I said before, he actually told both Anne and Liz that, but particularly Liz. Um, he often complained about prison about, and about his lost freedom. He did this with Anne as well. Um, Liz did visit Ted in Utah at least twice. Um, like I said, they were together, but not together. I'm not a hundred percent sure of the actual date they broke up because she still features in his life for, for a little while longer. And, um, <laughs> she didn't know, but she knew that he had other supporters at that point in time, at least one other supporter in Utah at that point in time. She calls her Kim Andrews at least at that point in time. He had many survivors, supporters, but he had to have at least one that would fully listen to him, let's just say, and be around for him whenever he wanted. So Ted was extradited to Colorado, Colorado's Pitkin County Jail, um, which is in Aspen, on January 28th of 1977. Um, 
he was still in regular contact with Anne at this point in time and, and would be, like I said, for many years afterwards. Um, she found he now mocked the justice system that he had he once loved. He was very bitter about it, particularly police officers, um, the prosecution, and um, the press. He was also down on the press at this point in time, thinking that they were mislabeling things and telling people false information about him. Um, he was also unhappy with his own legal team as well. Of course, like I said, he always thought he was smarter than everybody anyway, and he had been a law student. So he thought who better to mount my defense, but myself is what he thought. So there was a preliminary trial, of course, that took place. And this was on April 14th, or sorry, April 4th of 1977, um, to see if there was enough evidence, of course, to, to charge him with this murder. Um, everything was circumstantial though, guys. I want to remind you that all he had was that map with the Wildwood Inn circled on it. Um, it was, a, it was, and of course the, the, um, the Utah witnesses that were able to pick him out from, from the lineup, but they didn't want, uh, his defense team obviously didn't want the Utah cases put into that. Regardless, a judge did order him to stand trial for Karen Campbell's murder. And Ted asked at that point in time, he fired his lawyers. He fired his lawyers and asked to represent himself. And of course the judge agreed to it because he had been a law student, but he had to retain his former lawyers as co-counsel. So he was transferred to Garfield County Jail on April 13th of 1977. That's the same day they found um, Gordon Edwin Sanderson in the septic tank. It's also my dad's birthday. So one of my dad's birthdays. So they actually found, um, he was transferred on April 13th of 1977 and his trial date was set for November 14th of 1977. So Ted was set to have a hearing at this point in time to see if the death penalty would be used in the Karen Campbell case. Okay, so he was supposed to have this hearing. It would be kind of like a few hours worth of stuff, guys. And on June, this was going to be on June 7th. Now, because Ted was acting as his own counsel, because he was part of his legal defense, he was able to use the law library, right? He's able to do this. And he'd gotten pretty chummy with most of the guards from the Garfield County Jail at this point in time. He actually did this with Pitkin County too. He got pretty chummy with the guards. Everybody thought he was a nice guy. I seem to like them actually. And um, because of this, and because of the fact that he was at this hearing about the death penalty, he wasn't wearing his handcuffs, nor was he wearing his leg irons. So he was allowed to use the law library when they were on lunch break. This was ostensibly to study. He was in the back stacks and the guard that they had was actually at the front of the library. Ted eased up a window. They were on the second floor and jumped out. He had been wearing two layers of clothing. So he just shed the first layer and the second layer enabled him to blend in with other people. And he literally just walked away from the courthouse. Now he did actually injure his foot in the fall. So he, he more or less limped away, but nobody was none the wiser. He actually escaped from Colorado. This would be his first escape attempt. And he was gone for about six days. Now guys, you have to remember that this is June it's an Aspen, so it still gets cold at night. And it was also very rainy at this point in time. They had a lot of days of rain. And Ted had injured himself. Now, he was able to make it up into the mountains. He broke into a couple cabins and stole some food from there. But he was becoming exhausted. In fact, um, some of the searchers were at one of the cabins. And he remembers hearing them from in the trees. Regardless, he also, he was suffering from exposure at this point in time, he had the injury to his foot and he was exhausted, guys. He was exhausted. Now, he, on the sixth day, managed to steal a Cadillac. Like I said, he likes to steal cars, but he couldn't control the Cadillac and he was fishtailing everywhere. So, of course, he was pulled over by police who caught him blocks away from the courthouse he escaped from. Blocks away. He ended up circling right back into Aspen, guys. Regardless, they caught Ted Bundy. And of course he was back in jail and he was never allowed to go without, um, well, he was never supposed to be allowed to go without the, the wrist cuffs and the 
leg irons while he was in court from then on. So even though Ted claimed to love Liz and that there is evidence at this point in time that this is when he started to contact Carol Ann Boone and start to work her over too. She became his staunchest supporter for quite a while, guys. She's, you're, you'll hear about her in the next video. We've already talked about her a little bit. She used to make fun of him for being Ted, but now she's his staunchest supporter and, and she helps work on his case with him at this point in time. Um, Liz had officially backed off of the relationship by this point in time. She needed some distance between herself and Ted. Uh, Ted now threw himself, I mean, what else does he have to do, into representing himself for his murder trial, especially since the prosecutors wanted to bring in the Utah cases um, as evidence of a pattern, of course, as evidence that this is a pattern that Ted Bundy follows. So there was a victory for Ted on November 2nd of 1977 because the judge refused to allow the Utah cases, aside from Carol DeRanche's, into um, evidence. They would be able to listen to Carol DeRanche's testimony from what he had done to her in Utah. He's already been prosecuted for it. Um, on December 27th of 1977, he won again because the death penalty in Colorado was taken off the case. So Ted no longer cared at this point in time, though, guys. He no longer cared because he had another plan in action. He literally didn't care what happened anymore at all with his trial. Um, he knew the jail set up at Garfield County. I believe he was back in Garfield County. He might have been in Pitkin Jail again. He knew the setup very well when he was extradited right he knew it he knew the jail inside and out he was able he studied the building let's just say fairly well so he knew the systems he knew where tiles led he knew things of that nature so at some point in time he was able to obtain a hacksaw from another inmate you know the prison trading system he would never reveal who that was Snitches get stitches, and Ted Bundy was not a snitch. He was many things, but I guess he wasn't a snitch. Uh, he was able to get a hacksaw, and he cut a 12 by 12 square from the top of his cell roof. He was able to do that. Um, at this point in time, this is only 12 by 12 inches, guys, not feet, inches. At this point in time, he was able to starve himself down. He kept saying that the food was really terrible. And I've heard the jail food really is, but and he couldn't eat it and things of that nature. So he lost a lot of weight. He was able to get himself down to 140 pounds, guys. And on the night of December 30th, he crept through the ceiling and had a look around to see where um, he could drop out in. Now, luckily for him, he was able to drop out into a jailer's apartment. One of the jailers actually lived, um, I think actually several of them, but this was one specific jailer's apartment, um, was attached to the jail. So he could actually literally drop down into this guy's apartment. So he looked around. He went back up through the ceiling, back into his cell, stuffed his law papers into his bunk for some reason, like under his mattress, went back up through the ceiling. This is December 30th of 1977. Went back up through the ceiling, dropped back down into the jailer's apartment because while well, he had been there the first time, he had actually heard the jailer and his wife leave. So he knew it was empty. Stole some of the jailer's clothes, changed into them, opened the front door and walked away a free man. And he was going to stay free for a little while. We're going to leave it there today, guys. I've talked a lot. This has been a lot, guys. I'm sure there's probably a lot more that I've left out that you guys might want to get into. It's just, you know, limited time, guys. Limited time. Um, so that's where we're going to leave it today. Ted has now officially escaped from Colorado twice, and he had another escape kit at the ready at one point in time, too. Um, people now know he's on the radar. He's been at least uh, charged with murder at least once. Utah is building cases against him. Washington is trying to at this point in time. They've stalled out somewhat. So what do you guys think? Oh, I feel like Ted was really deluding himself and trying to say that most psychologists found him normal. I feel like that was just something he was telling people. Now, I'm sure there were psychologists that did find him normal because he was able to outsmart people. But at the same point in time, I think he was just deluding himself at this point in time. Um, I think he was telling people what they wanted to hear. Why do you think he chose to kill in Colorado? Washington, he lived there. Utah, he lived there. Oregon is not that far from Washington. He knew that place. Idaho. That was also an interesting choice. I know it's not that far away from the states we're talking about either, but why Colorado? 
I'm figuring it's because he figured he he wouldn't be caught on to as fast. I'm I'm literally I I feel like that's literally the reason why he stopped. He's like, oh, they're getting on. They, they, they're starting to put some pieces together. I don't know if he necessarily knew that police were checking him out. They had checked him out, but I don't know if he necessarily knew that. I know he didn't in Washington. I don't know about Utah. If, if he had an inkling that they were looking into him before he was arrested for the evading an officer and, and possession of the burglary tools. I don't know if he was onto that. I, I think it was his way of, number one, spreading out the carnage. Number two, making himself feel like a god, right? I can go from state to state and kill as many people as I want. No one will ever know. I think it was just part of him that was driving him to do that. But I think another part of him figured it wouldn't be connected. Because he probably knew, I'm sure he knew, that police jurisdictions don't generally share information with each other. But what do you guys think? Um, what do you make of him getting caught so easily? <laughs> The first time he escaped, I'm sorry, guys, literally the officer looked in. And he's like, hi. So he was, of course, hauled back off. What do you guys make of that? What do you guys make of the fact that he was caught? Not in the act of killing anybody, but basically because his car looked strange and was in a residential area. He, this, The officer that caught him probably did stop him from killing somebody that night. But I'm just, what do you guys make of him being caught so easily at that point in time? Um... Let me know what you think. What do you guys think of him getting the hacksaw? I know that they have like the jailhouse. Um, they have ways of getting stuff. It's like a jailhouse theft system almost. Trade system where you can trade one item for another. That's how they make their shanks and shivs and things of that nature. Not shivs. Shivs are already sharp. But that's how generally they get stuff to make shanks. That's how they get drugs. That's how they make their pruno. Um, is this trading system. What do you make of the fact that he was able to get a hacksaw though? What do you make of the fact that, that, that another inmate had this hacksaw? Let me know down below guys. I've rambled on long enough. Next week... Come hell or high water, guys, it will be end game. I, I, I don't know how much how much more I can do Ted Bundy psychologically. So next week will be the end. I hope you guys will join me. I hope you guys liked this video. Um, I hope you guys subscribed if you already haven't. Hit the notification bell. Share if you want to. Please leave me some comments. Tell me what you guys think. Is this too much? Is it too little? Is there something I left out? Let me know down below. And hopefully I'll see you guys back here next week. Bye, guys.